So let me remind you um, where we've got to so far. Uh, lecture one, I basically uh, told you that there is a duality, Fourier duality, between the primes and the zeros of the zeta function. Um, so if you know, have information about the primes, that tells you something about the zeros and vice versa. And that's embodied in the explicit formula. <clears throat> in the second lecture, I told you that there is a conjectured relationship between the statistics of the zeros of the, um, of the zeta function and the eigenvalues of, uh, of random matrices. And I framed this um, in the setting of the uh, of random unitary matrices. But I should emphasize that everything I said yesterday would apply equally well to uh, the GUE, uh, to complex emission matrices. Um, and there's no real distinction at the level of the discussion I gave yesterday. Um, the limiting results as n tends to infinity, matrix i tends to infinity, the same in both cases. And the idea is that uh, one can prove a result consistent with this connection. This is Montgomery's theorem, uh, which says that in, for some limited class of test functions, um, you can really prove a, th this relationship. Um, but if you want to prove this for a, a wider class of test functions, the functions that we believe it's true for, um, then you need information about pair correlations of prime numbers that we don't know how to prove at the moment. If you take the standard conjectures in the field, then, then you can establish this connection with random matrix theory, um, but we don't know how to prove those conjectures. And the question I left with was, is that conjecture about the pair correlation of the um, primes, um, that implies Montgomery's conjecture uh, is true, um, but are they equivalent? Uh, uh, um, where I left off with, w was with saying that, uh, in fact, you can get away with less. And let me tell you what you can get away with. And let, let me tell you precisely what Montgomery's conjecture for the pair correlation of the zeros of the zeta function is equivalent to in terms of counting prime numbers. So this goes back to a classical problem in the theory of primes. In fact, one of the earliest problems that was uh, identified by Gauss. Uh, so, when, at the end of the 18th century, Gauss, as a prodigious uh, young uh, mathematician, uh, did calculations uh, of uh, primes, counted primes in various intervals, and this led him to the experimental uh, conjecture, which is now called the prime number theorem. So, the prime number theorem came from was originally proposed by Gauss in 1796 uh, based on, on numerical computations. It's our numerical data uh, generated by hand. And what Gauss did was the following. He took um, consecutive integers, um, a range of consecutive integers, and he took, uh, a, in his calculations, which still exist, uh, we, we have the the notes in which he did the calculations, he would consider um, ranges of integers of length 1,000. So he considered the first 1,000 integers, the second 1,000 integers, the third 1,000 integers, etc. And all in all, in his, in his calculations, he considered 3,000 ranges of integers, which means he computed the primes uh, amongst the first 3 million uh, integers. Um, pardon? Gauss was the computer. Uh, uh, and uh, he said that by the time he got up to full speed, it took him 15 minutes to check a 1,000 integers. Um, and I should say that, that in 1796, Gauss was about 15 years old. So this, in that sense, we're all past it. Um, uh, so, um, so he, uh, and he records very carefully how many primes there were in each 
range of a thousand consecutive integers. There is a name for a, a thousand consecutive integers in um, certainly in well, certainly in English, probably in other other, other languages too. It's called the Kiliad uh, in, in English. Um, although I suspect that that the origins of that term are not uh, Anglo-Saxon. Um, so in a, in a Kiliad. The range of consecutive in, thousand consecutive integers. Gauss counted how many primes there were. He recorded that number. Then in the next thousand integers. Then in the next thousand integers, and um, he analysed the data statistically, and he observed something like a normal distribution in the fluctuations. So you count the number of primes in a given Kiliad. That's a number you record. Then the number in the next Kiliad. Then the number in the next Kiliad. Those numbers fluctuate. Um, if he averaged over his 3,000 kiliads, he ended up with the prime number theorem, that the primes uh, get logarithmically a little uh, less dense as you go up, but you can compensate for that with what we now would call the, uh, the von Neumann, uh, the uh, von Mangold function. Um, but he observed fluctuations around, around the average that's given by the prime number theorem, um, and he sort of understood that the, the, the data pointed to a central limit theorem, although he didn't state it quite in that way. Um, and he sort of understood that the variance was an interesting quantity of these fluctuations. And so how would we in modern notation set up this variance? Well, we're to count the primes in a range of consecutive integers. So let's count them between um, uh, x and x plus h. So in Gauss's experiment, capital H would be 1,000. And we understand now from the theory of the zeta function, explicitly from the explicit formula, that the right way to count the primes is to count the primes and their powers together using the von Mangold function. Um, and so we're to estimate something like this. So in Gauss's case, capital H would be 1,000. And we, 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 uh, but you can think of this as, as, as sort of general variable. And the question is, what's the size of, of this sort of sum? So in, the, in modern terminology, this would be counting primes in short intervals. We're not, letting, we're not looking for the sum from n is 1 to some very large number. We're looking from one very large number to that number plus capital H, which may also itself be large. Um, and so what would you expect for this? Well, the prime number theorem tells us that the average size of the von Mangelt function is 1. Because I remind you, uh, the prime number theorem says that if we sum the von Mangelt function from 1 to capital X, uh, this is asymptotic to X. So the average size is 1. So we'd expect this, on average, to be capital H. So let's subtract off capital H. That's what we expect it to be on average. And then ask what the variance is of this quantity. So we'll square it. And then average with respect to the starting point. Uh, and this is the variance in modern terminology that Gauss um, was interested in. Um, and he, he had the numerical data, but he didn't frame a, con a precise conjecture for what this was. If the primes were completely uncorrelated Poisson variables, uh, we'd expect this to be, we'd expect the variance to be the size of the mean, and so we'd expect this to be uh, H if the primes had no correlate, if they were uncorrelated. That turns out not to be the case. And there's a conjecture of um, Golston and Montgomery. Which is that the correct answer should it be, is that it should be h times the log of x over h plus some constant. And the constant is known as a precise value. Uh, this is asymptotic as capital X tends to infinity. 
And technically, we need um, the range to grow with capital X, but it can grow very slowly. So X, uh, capital H has to be between um, X to the epsilon and X to the 1 minus epsilon. So basically, capital H has to grow more, more quickly than some small power of X. It could be um, smaller power as you like, and, and it, but it can't grow more quickly than X itself. And this is the conjecture of Golston Montgomery uh, for what the variance should be in the kind of numerical experiment that Gauss did. Um, and the theorem is, which I won't prove for you, um, is that Montgomery's conjecture is equivalent to Golston Montgomery. That is, if I know the pair correlation of the um, zeros of the zeta function, uh, that implies Golston Montgomery and vice versa. So this is why it's important to know about um, pair correlation of the zeros. This is the sort of information it gives you about the primes. It tells you about fluctuations in counting primes in short intervals, so fluctuations around the prime number theorem. Um, now, how do you prove this? Well, you, do, you put in the explicit formula uh, for uh, this sum. You know what to expect now. Um, the explicit formula will replace this sum by a sum over zeros. This is a fairly localized sum, so we expect a very long sum over zeros. And since we're squaring it, we get a sum over pairs of zeros. Um, and so the Left-hand side can be written as a sum of pairs of zeros, but that's precisely what Montgomery's conjecture tells us about. So that's the philosophy here. Um, and I should say that Hardy Littlewood, the conjecture about pair correlation of the von Mangelt function um, implies Golston Montgomery. So you can derive this Golston Montgomery conjecture uh, two ways. You can either assume Montgomery's conjecture or the Hard-Littlewood conjecture. You get the same answer uh, in both cases. Now, um, uh, now let me tell you a little bit about how all this generalizes to L functions. This implication does not assume the Riemann hypothesis. It's unconditional the last implication. Um, this implication here, um, no, it doesn't assume the Riemann hypothesis. Um, it might assume it in some, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't specify an error term in the hard littlewood conjecture. Uh, this assumes a well-behaved error term, and I'd have to think through exactly whether the assumption on the error term was equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. At the moment, I don't think it is, but I'm not completely sure about that. So now what about L functions? And I'll be a little schematic here, um, because I just want to give you a flavor of where the subject stands without going into too many details. Um, well, I told you yesterday that uh, there are lots of L functions, infinitely many, and they fall into different classes. Um, and uh, one way uh, to classify them is in terms of how many gamma functions appear in the, uh, in the functional equation. And 19th century L functions, like the Riemann zeta function and the Dirichlet L functions, which, which I introduced, have one gamma function in the functional equation. Um, the 20th century L functions, those associated with elliptic curves or modular forms, have two gamma functions. In the, in the functional equation, and we now know that there are many others with an increasing number of gamma functions, and these are, are being studied at the moment. Um, and there is, since, since many people here like uh, special functions, um, you can think of these L functions as like the special functions of, um, of number theory, um, and there is a database of them, a little like the, the sort of 
uh, books that we all know and love with, with properties of, of, of other special functions. And this is called the L functions and modular forms database. And you can find about, I think now it's about 3 million L functions with their properties tabulated, asymptotics given, et cetera, and plots of the first few zeros. Um, so you find that online. It's a sort of resource that, uh, on a, a, a d database that you find online. So the idea is that if you, I told you yesterday that if you fix your L function, any L function, we expect it to have a Riemann hypothesis. And for any L function, if you um, look at the statistics of the zeros um, vertically, that is along its critical line, um, you get the same answer as for the Riemann zeta function. That is the pair correlations of the uh, zeros will be the same as those of random unitary matrices, um, or GUE, if you prefer. Um, and uh, everything works out as, as I said yesterday. And you can prove a theorem consistent with that, and you can generalize that theorem to, to all k-point uh, k correlations or k-tuples of zeros. So this is a fixed L function uh, looking vertically in that way. And this tells us uh, then something about the, um, the generalization of the Golston-Montgomery conjecture. So if you, if you know the pair correlation of the zeros of an L function, uh, that tells you uh, information about the generalization of Gauss's problem, where you replace the von Mangold function by the von Mangold function associated with the L function, and that's just defined in terms of the log logarithmic derivative of the L function. So that kind of variance formula that I've written at the top there, there's a generalization of that uh, to all L functions, um, uh, where basically you replace the von Mangold function with the generalized von Mangold function associated with the L function in this way. And the only way we know how to approach this is then via sort of random matrix theory. So this is random matrix theory proved very important in this context. But there's another game you can play, which is not to fix your L function and then look vertically along its critical line, but rather to consider a family of L functions. So here's one, here's another L function, here's another L function. They each have their own zeros. For, uh, for L functions, what's the analog of the primes? Uh, they're the primes themselves. Um, but but the, the primes would be weighted differently. So if you remember the example that I gave you yesterday, yesterday um, the, the Dirichlet L functions, you, you simply get um, by taking the Euler product with the primes, but you weight the primes with some function which is a character of the multiplicity group modulo modulo d. So it, it's a good question. Uh, so this, in a sense, you, 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 the, the analog of the primes are the primes, but they have these extra weights associated with them. And for example, Dirichlet introduced these so he could count primes in different arithmetic progressions. This is what this character does. It picks out different arithmetic progressions. Um, so I'm thinking schematically now, I'm thinking of taking uh, a, a, a number of different L functions. For example, it could be this family of L functions, which is parameterized by an integer d. And so my integer d could be increasing in this direction. So this is d equals 1, d equals 2, d equals 3, et cetera. These are the L functions associated with those values of d. Uh, and here's a formula for those L functions. And then it's a, a, an idea of, of Katz and Sarnak. in um, about um, 
Um, to ask not what's the statistics of the zeros for a fixed L function vertically along, the, on it, along its critical line, but what if we fix a height of the, uh, 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 on the critical line and average through a family of L functions? So we average horizontally rather than vertically. vertically. So what's a sort of horizontal question? It might be, what's the height of the first zero? That's a question you can ask for a given L function. For each L function, there is a height of the first zero. What would the distribution of those heights be? Or put another way, what's the probability, so it's a different question now, that I have a zero um, within a distance, at least one zero within a distance alpha of this point here? Again, there will be a number of zeros for each L function uh, in a range of height uh, of size alpha measured from this point here. That number will fluctuate. Uh, what are the fluctuations? And it was realized by Katz and Sarnak that if we average vertically, you always get the unitary group. But if you average horizontally, you can get, depending on which family of L functions you take, either the unitary group, the orthogonal group, or the symplectic group. So in particular, this family of L functions, the Dirichlet L functions, um, these form a symplectic family. And if you take L functions associated with elliptic curves, which I have not defined for you, that would take me too far afield, um, you get um, the orthogonal group. And then the calculations that I showed you yesterday, uh, you can reproduce in these various different settings. So you can ask um, for the uh, unitary group, the orthogonal group, and the symplectic group separately, what are the correlations of the uh, eigenvalues of those uh, of matrices representing elements of those groups. Um, uh, you do those calculations, and then there's an analog of Montgomery's theorem um, for various families of L functions where your average is horizontal rather than vertical. And the, the finding is that the, uh, the analog of Montgomery's theorem matches random matrix theory in each case, but you get different answers, so that the answers are different for unitary, orthogonal, and symplectic. Um, so you see the differences between families of L functions in the statistics of zeros near to this point, the sort of symmetry point, the reflection point of the uh, functional equation. Um, you see differences in the statistics, and those differences represent the different classical compact groups. And whilst this is, again, um, it's a fact, it's a, a numerical observation, the data is very is extremely convincing. There are theorems consistent with this data that differentiate these groups um, and that express consistency from various horizontal averages with random matrix theory. Again, the, the, these theorems, like Montgomery's theorem yesterday, are a little um, uninsightful in that you do a calculation in number theory, it looks nothing like a calculation in random matrix theory, uh, but lo and behold, you get the same answer. But you don't see any reason why you get the same answer. And I would say that, that they, these calculations give one uh, confirmation, but, but little perhaps insight or little deeper philosophy as to why this is true. Um, but that's all I want to say about this, this, uh, this generalization, other than that it exists and it's very important, and it gives one a much bigger picture um, but the, the picture's simply like for the Riemann zeta function. You do complicated calculations. They, the combinatorics become very difficult, but lo and behold, you get an answer that matches an answer that has some determinantal structure coming from random matrix theory, but you don't see that determinantal structure or that integrable structure anywhere in the number theory. It's simply a coincidence. Yes? In particular, horizontal averages is... Yes. Capital N in these matrix models going to infinity as well. Yes, right? yes, still going to yes, infinity. yeah, yeah. Even for the low lying zeros. Even the low, for the low lying zeros, because the density um, depends very slightly on D. Uh, and so as you go in this direction, the zeros get more dense. 
Yes. Right. So, so um, uh, for the horizontal average, the density of zeros goes like log of uh, d t over two pi. Uh, so it increases log. If you fix t, it still increases logarithmically with d. <laughs> <laughs> or even some weird, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there, there, are, uh, there are, there have been numerical explorations which do allow one to explore this sort of picture in all sorts of different directions. And there are, there's an interesting story there, but that would take me a long time to tell. So if you do uh, uh, vertically for any L functions, you have UM. Yes. If you go horizontally, you have one of the three classes. Exactly. Uh, no more. No more. Exactly, but you know, this is all that one gets. Um, and if I have time tomorrow, I'm not sure exactly what I'll do tomorrow. It depends on how much I get through today. Um, uh, I, I may tell you that there is a world in which this is a theorem. Um, so there are everything I've told you so far about the Riemann zeta function and the L functions. Uh, uh, concerns the special functions, the L functions associated with integers. If you go to a more algebraic setting where you associate these L functions um, with, uh, with polynomials defined over some finite field, uh, then everything I've said so far is a theorem. And you can prove it all in a certain limit, which I may get around to telling you about tomorrow. If not, I can answer over coffee with anyone who's interested. But everything I've said so far becomes a theorem in this other, in this rather babyish setting. But there you can really identify what these groups are. And these, these classical groups are the ones that appear. OK, but I think what I want to do today is to move on to a different um, class of problems which illustrate in a different way um, the relationship between number theory and random matrix theory, and that it's a very deep relationship, but still somewhat mysterious. And this is the problem of moments. So rather than looking at the... Um, distribution, the statistics of the distribution of the zeros of an L function. I now want to think about the distribution of the values of the L function, um, which may be zero or between the zeros will be non-zero. I want to know what the probability distribution is of the values of the L function on the critical line. And in random matrix theory, the analog of this would be um, to look at the characteristic polynomial. So I get my unitary matrix A. I'm back in the unitary group now. And I form the characteristic polynomial uh, determinant of i minus a e to the minus i theta, uh, which is just uh, product over the eigenvalues of uh, 1 minus e to the i, e to n minus theta. So you can think of this as the analog of a, of a zeta function in that it has zeros. Um, and the zeros of this function are the eigenphases of the matrix A. Um, and in that sense, it, it, it's, it's a function with interesting zeros, just like the Riemann zeta function is. Uh, so let's study its values. And the problem is to consider uh, the moments of, uh, there are several problems one might want to consider. Uh, the moments would be if we take the average of the modulus of the determinant to some power. Two beta. And in random matrix theory, this is, a, this is a, um, an interesting problem. Um, and it can be addressed in a number of ways. Uh, in particular, um, 
It can be addressed using Fisher-Hartwig asymptotics. Uh, you can write these moments in terms of um, Tuplet's determinants, and so the sorts of material that uh, you've been seeing in Estelle's lectures and uh, Alexander's lectures become important. Um, but I, I want to take a slightly different approach, um, which is um, something Alexander mentioned yesterday. Uh, so you can write these moments exactly. Um, so I, I said yesterday that the average over the unitary group, this is an average with respect to harm measure. And the harm measure on the unitary group, uh, there's a formula for that called the vial integration formula. Um, which allows you to write this exactly as a multiple integral. Alexander wrote down examples of this kind of integral. Um, so we're to get the quantity we want to average. That's the quantity here and write it in terms of the eigenvalues. Well, here's a formula for that. So we have the product n is one to capital N of the modulus one minus e to the i beta n minus theta to the power two beta. That's the quantity we want to average. And the measure coming from the violent integration formula is just the van der Mond factor So that's a formula for the quantity, for the, for the moments, as a, uh, an n-fold multiple integral uh, with a very explicit integrand. And um, uh, if you do write this as a van der Mond determinant, um, you can analyze the problem in that way. And then you're, you're immediately led to, if you want to consider the large n asymptotics, uh, this becomes a problem of exactly the sort that Alex Alexandra and Estelle have been considering. Um, there is a different approach, which Alexander mentioned, which is to use the Selberg integral. So um, I'll do this on the board over here. So I'm sure many of you have met uh, this integral. Um, so Euler's beta integral is an integral of the form integral 0 to 1, t to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus t to the beta minus 1 dt. And Euler famously evaluated this to be gamma of alpha, gamma of beta, divided by gamma of alpha plus beta. And it was a question first raised by Selberg whether there's a multi-dimensional uh, analog of this. And so Selberg considered um, an integral of the form 0 to 1 an integral of that form. And he found um, that there is an answer for this, uh, um, which resembles this product of ratios of gamma functions. It's an exact evaluation of this integral. And, and the story is rather interesting. Alexander's been talking interestingly about the history of Riemann-Hilbert problems and uh, Sago's theorem, and so is Estelle. The, the history here is no less interesting. Um, so Selberg, when he had this idea to look at integrals like this, was a PhD student uh, in Norway in 1941, um, which was a time when the, there was perhaps less mixing in the mathematical community than there would be now. 
so he wasn't aware that this had been studied before or not, and he rather suspected that this integral had been evaluated. Uh, he evaluated it in 1941 and mentioned it in the footnote of a paper. Um, and then uh, by about 1944, um, he'd searched the literature and hadn't found uh, an evaluation of this integral. So he wrote a, a fuller, a more extensive paper, but he still thought that probably this was known to experts, may even have been known to Euler. Um, and so he buried this paper in about the most obscure way that you can. Um, he wrote it, first of all, in Norwegian, um, which is understandable, as that was his native language. Um, but he published it in a, high, uh, in a journal for Norwegian high school teachers. Um, uh, and it's about the most obscure journal uh, you, you could imagine. Um, uh, in 1944, he published the answer, which I say resembles this, this formula. I'll give you a special case of it in a minute. Um, this also tells about the quality of high school education. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, well, it tells us also about the, the quality, if you like, the culture of us as a mathematical community. So Selberg wrote this in 1944, and the history is rather curious. Um, the paper wasn't cited at all in any following publication uh, until 1979. So it went completely unnoticed. Um, and that's perhaps understandable. Not many people would go to this journal. But Selberg was a Fields medalist uh, in 1950. And so you think you would have thought people might have looked at his early papers and dug this paper out. But it seems nobody did. Um, and in the meantime, many people worked on this problem, a special case of this integral. So famously, Dyson thought about this in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, Mater did. And um, many people thought about, tried to evaluate special cases of this, of this integral unsuccessfully um, uh, without knowing that Selberg had already evaluated the general case. It's all, all even more surprising that Dyson was in the same institution as Selberg and was trying to do this for at least a decade, and never, Selberg didn't, didn't tell him he'd done it. Uh, and in 19, <laughs> and, it, and it seems he was aware of this. It seems that he was secretly enjoying the fact that this whole community of random matrix theorists was trying to evaluate these integrals, they're called the, uh, the Dyson conjectures and this sort of thing, all proved in a result that was at least 20 years older by, by Selberg, and he didn't tell anybody until Bombieri, another Fields medalist, got interested in these multiple integrals and uh, went to ask Selberg's advice. And at that stage, only then did Selberg reveal that he'd already evaluated this integral. Um, people have been struggling for, say, nearly 20 years to do it. So um, there's a, a little insight into the, uh, into the psychology of various famous mathematicians. Um, but the Selberg integral does it allow you to, it looks exactly like this, of course. There's some change of variables that needs to be done. Uh, I won't go through the details of that. Um, the change of variables not, not straightforward, but you can see that the structure is more or less the same. And this evaluates to be Uh, that product of ratios of gamma functions using the Selberg integral. Uh, so that's an exact evaluation. And I should emphasize that the, the, the reason why you can evaluate the Selberg integral, it's not at all clear from Selberg's writings on it. Uh, there's a very deep reason why these integrals are exactly of the kind that can be evaluated. And that's very much connected with the theory of integrable systems. So these integrals happen to be very closely related to representation theory. Um, there's a generalization of these, which makes that much clearer, called the McDonald constant term identities. Um, so that there's a deep connection between root systems uh, of, uh, of Lie groups um, uh, uh, um, and the, the, the symmetries of, the, uh, of those root systems and the ability to evaluate integrals like this. But I won't go into that now. So you can evaluate these integrals for very deep reasons. That's the answer in this case. And if you evaluate this asymptotically now, 
Um, this becomes uh, g squared of 1 plus beta divided by g of 1 plus 2 beta n to the power beta squared. Um, where this is the Barnes g function that we saw yesterday in Alexander's lectures. And to remind you, um, the gamma function satisfies gamma of s plus 1 is s times gamma of s, and the g function satisfies g of s plus 1 is gamma of s times g of s. So it's an entire function of order 2 which generalizes the, generalizes the gamma function. And um, as Alexander emphasized, um, this function appears very naturally in kind of fischer hartwig asymptotics, and that's no surprise. You could address this asymptotic problem um, using fischer hartwig theory as well. And give rise to the same answer. So we understand uh, moments um, of characteristic polynomials. You can generalize the moments. Um, so one generalization that's proved very popular in recent years is let's say A and B are sets of cardinality. K, uh, then we can consider, um, I don't want to write this, yeah, um, product of alpha in A of determinant I minus A e to the minus I theta plus alpha. times a product of beta in B times the determinant of I minus A. Oh, that's bad notation, isn't it? Uh, two, two A's, yeah. So um, let me call them C and D then. Can I have alpha in C? I suppose I can. Um, If I take the complex conjugate of the second one, then these sort of shifted moments uh, are of considerable importance in random matrix theory. They sort of reveal the symmetries behind the characteristic polynomial in a way that the moments don't. The moments are degenerate cases of these shifted moments when all the alphas and betas uh, tend to zero. Uh, and one can evaluate these um, uh, averages as well. Um, and in this case, the Selberg integral doesn't help you. Uh, the, there isn't a Selberg integral to, that we know of to evaluate averages of this kind. But there are other tricks uh, that allow you, can you to evaluate this. Uh, so the integrable. Uh, sort of structure comes in, and we, we know how to evaluate um, products like this. And, and in the limit alpha and beta 10 to 0, you recover the moment formulae. I'm mentioning this generalization because it will become important when I talk a little bit about uh, uh, number theory. So now, um, what's the number theory analog of this? Well, we, we've learned to expect that the average over the unitary group is like an average up the critical line. So in the case of the Riemann zeta function, um, we could get the zeta function on the critical line. Uh, we're to take the modulus of that and raise it to the power 2 beta. and then average this along the critical line. 
And these moments for the zeta function have a long history. They go back, they were first studied by Hardy and Littlewood in 1918. And the question is, um, can one evaluate the asymptotics? So this is purely a problem in asymptotic analysis. There's, there's very little number theory now. I, I defined the zeta function for you. So sum over the integers. Um, and so this looks like a, a straightforward problem in asymptotics. Um, we're not letting beta grow, so there's no subtlety associated with that. Uh, but it turns out to be extremely difficult. And there's a long and very um, tortured history to this problem. Um, so there is a general conjecture. So the conjecture, which I'll write in modern form, is that what we expect this to be is um, uh, we expect this to go asymptotically like log t to the power of beta squared at leading order. And uh, we expect there to be a prefactor to make this a, a good asymptotic. Uh, and the prefactor is expected to be a constant or a function of beta, which is given by a product over primes. So there is some function of beta, which you can write down very explicitly um, as a product over primes. Um, but the problem is, it's now understood that's not correct. So this was initially thought to be correct, but it's now not thought to be correct. And so one puts in a fudge factor, uh, which I'll call f zeta of beta. And the question is, what's the fudge factor f that makes this a correct asymptotic? And the reason this is subtle is, um, well, the reason people originally missed out the fudge factor was that the theorem of Hardy and Littlewood, um, so f zeta of beta uh, of 1, turns out to be 1. And that's a theorem of Hardy and Littlewood. in 1918. Um, well, the reason this problem became interesting was that when people calculated f zeta of 2, uh, this turned out not to be 1. Uh, it turns out to be a 12. Um, and this is a theorem of uh, Ingham. In 1926. Sorry? Who is f of zeta? So you have conjecture? Yes. But, but then you say there is a theorem that f of zeta is of one is one. Is it? Yeah. So there's some function. The question is what function of beta? So, so, so the definition of f of zeta is this prefactor in this problem. Exactly. No, no, the, no, 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 no. It's, uh, the, the definition is, uh, is what's the function, assuming it exists, which is the two beta moment of the zeta function divided by log t to the power beta squared divided by this function of beta. Okay. Well, then, uh, is that clear? Well, then it is not, is that, then it is not a conjecture, so you have... No, it is a conjecture. One is a theorem, a conjecture. Yeah. It's a conjecture. I, I, yeah, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what this is for. Okay, okay. so how? Oh, okay. I, I, I know the value of f for, for beta is 1 and beta equals 2. What I'm about to tell you is. So, so it is for beta equals 1, for beta equals 2, it is a theorem. It is a theorem. Oh. Exactly. I'm writing this in a rather convoluted way uh, for a particular reason, just to tease my audience, and I'm glad that I. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, 
No, it's, uh, first of all, I think historically it was thought that f of beta would always be 1 because its first value was 1. Uh, then it was realized that f of 2 is a 12th. Uh, so it, the surprise is that's not 1. And the second surprise is that it's, if it's not 1, that it's a rational number. So there's no a priori reason to expect f of beta to be anything. If it's going to be anything, you might think it would be 1. Um, but if it's not going to be 1, there's no reason to expect it to be a rational number at 2. And as I'll indicate um, tomorrow, um, the history then gets very murky. Uh, we don't know any other value of f of zeta rigorously. There is no further theorem on this matter. But there are conjectures. Um, there's a conjecture. Uh, so I'm going to write a 12 as 2 over 2 squared factorial and 1 is 1 over 1 squared factorial. Uh, so you might think now you spot the pattern. Uh, <laughs> 1, 2, uh, well, f zeta of 3 is conjectured to be um, 42 over 3 squared factorial. And this is a conjecture of Conry and Gosch. in about 1990. And f zeta of 4 has been conjectured to be 24,024 divided by 4 squared factorial. And this is Conry and Gonek in about uh, 1998. Dates are a little imprecise there. Um, and the, the sort of prehistory of the subject is um, that you have a theorem in these two cases. You have conjectures in these two cases. So there is a method, clearly, that's giving rise to these numbers. Um, but if you then apply that same method to any value of beta greater than 4, you get a negative answer. And clearly, you're trying to calculate something that's strictly non-negative. So e, this, is, this is leading order asymptotics that's extremely difficult. And uh, so I'm not making fun of the people who were involved in this. This is a huge, huge, huge enterprise and a great achievement um, that they uh, got this far. But it's clear that the method they were using, whatever that method is, and I'll tell you more about that tomorrow, um, is actually on very shaky ground. Because if you apply that exact same method for any value of beta greater than 4, uh, you get answers that are manifestly ridiculous. So the question is, uh, what's going on here? Uh, how does random matrix theory play a part? How does number theory play a part? How do we understand this problem of this category 1 error of things sort of suddenly becoming negative when they obviously have to be positive? Um, how does this generalize? Uh, we now have a more general understanding that this um, of this asymptotics, that these moments should grow not just as log t to some power, uh, but for the integer moments, there should be some polynomial. This is a polynomial uh, of order beta squared. Um, and the belief now is that the sum, that the, that the asymptotics is given by a polynomial function of log t of order beta squared, and then the remainder is exponentially small in that large variable log t. So it's a very interesting form of asymptotics where you have a finite asymptotic expansion and then the terms beyond that become ex exponentially small. Um, so I'll tell you more about this tomorrow. And what about the Euler product? This Euler product, where did you, with cardiovigals and then where did you get it from? Oh, uh, so again, I'll tell you that, I'll tell you more about that tomorrow. It, but crudely speaking, if you were to put in, if you were to do a completely ridiculous thing and to try to substitute the Euler product for the zeta function in here, now this is a ridiculous thing that you would only try amongst your very closest friends, um, <laughs> you put the Euler product in here and you assume the primes are independent of each other, so you can interchange the average and the product over primes, you're basically led to this formula with f of, is 1. And I think 
Almost certainly that's what Hardy and Littlewood did when they framed the conjecture originally, but they didn't say that. And so... Uh, so Z is degree of non-independence. Exactly, exactly. F is the... Exactly. F measures correlations between the primes um, in a way that we've seen that random matrix theory captures. Okay, so thank you very much. We have several questions. <laughs> So, some further questions or comments? Can you maybe define how, uh, what characterizes a class of L functions? Because there is clearly something going on with the yes. ensemble. So, is there some sort of a condition on this class that's giving rise to this? No, there is no. I would say there are many papers written on this subject, but I would say I can't distill all that information down into a, a bite-sized piece of information. I would say I do not understand what constitutes a, a, a family of L functions in this context. So there are natural guesses. So you might take all the Dirichlet L functions to be a family. Um, you might take all twists of some elliptic curve to be a family, but there's no a priori reason why you would believe that. Um, and what it usually boils down to is, is an experimental observation that you, you take a group of L functions, you do some calculation that's like Montgomery's conjecture, and then you find it happens to agree with random matrix theory for one of the classical groups. And then you say, aha, this is a family, and it's an orthogonal or a symplectic or a unitary family. Now, that, that's slightly overstating the case. There are sorts of indications that one might look for. But this, I would say, is still at the level of, of intuition-driven um, experimental science, not what I would call a sophisticated, all-embracing sort of philosophy. Another very rather simple question. Uh, is there some relation between the distribution and the number of gamma functions, the product of gamma functions that you find? Oh, very good question, yeah. So, um, so the, um, the number of gamma functions does appear. I, I didn't emphasize this because it would have taken me too far, but the, for example, the number of gamma functions that appears uh, would appear in this formula there. So the fact that the number of gamma functions for the zeta function is one means there's a one there. If you were to put, uh, if you were to look at L functions with two gamma factors, there would be a two there. So it does appear. Some other questions? Uh, and just to, perhaps just to say that again, uh, the, the number of gamma factors appears in this picture in a very uh, profound way, and this is the origin of a lot of its appearance. Um, for the um, for L functions with one gamma factor, they all have essentially the same density of zeros. Um, and it's given by a formula like that. So if you fix D, this gives you the density as T grows. And if you fix T, this gives you the density as D grows. If you have two gamma factors, you have twice the density of zeros. Three gamma factors means three times the density of zeros. So another way of saying how many gamma factors are there in the function equation is, what's the density of zeros, what's the ratio of the density of zeros to that of the Riemann zeta function? And it's an integer, and it's, it's there. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So any other questions? OK. So the, uh, this asymptotic description here, the leading order of behavior is log t to the beta squared. Yes. Is it known that the ratio has a limit? No. Um, it's known in the case uh, b tree equals 1 and b tree equals 2. That's all that's known. There are, um, there are upper bounds and lower bounds, which are consistent with this log t to the beta squared. The lower bounds, basically the upper and lower bounds agree to be uh, something like log t to the beta squared, but it's not completely clear that what, whether there's an asymptotic in there. Um, uh, the, so the upper and lower bounds both have log t to the beta squared. The lower bounds are unconditional. The upper bounds depend on the Riemann hypothesis. So on the, on the Riemann hypothesis, you would certainly believe that this is the right asymptotic, but the, the upper and lower bounds wouldn't give you this to make it a full asymptotic. Mm -hmm. Some other questions? Maybe I have a question. So you show the, the, the average of characteristic polynomial, and then you show the yes. moment. So the connection, you will talk about it tomorrow. I will. And then maybe I want to ask, so what about if you take GUE? It will be the same 
Yeah, so for the GUE, um, you can also analyze it in more or the same way. There isn't uh, a nice, simple formula like this for a finite size GUE matrix. But if you scale your moments appropriately with the correct mean density given by the semicircle, uh, you do get a limit that looks like that. So in the limit of large matrix size, uh, you get simple formulae out that look like this, but you then have to, as I say, uh, you, you get here basically the local density of zeros uh -huh. given by the semicircle. But you law. need the asymptotic formula only You need for the asymptotic the formula, okay. yeah. There isn't a nice simple formula like that. Okay, so some other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, regarding the picture of the uh, average of the, on the families Families of uh, random matrices where the scaling limit in each family is the UN, the, the sine kernel, and then you can do a sort of average and get the ON. Yes, yes. so uh, a good question, uh, Fabio. Um, so if, in fact, the, the examples I wrote down, if you take the... Um, uh, the orthogonal or the symplectic group, um, the um, eigenvalues of matrices of orthogonal symplectic matrices lie on the unit circle. Uh, but in these two cases, in the orthogonal and symplectic cases, they come in complex conjugate pairs. Um, so the eigenvalues of the form e to the plus or minus i theta n. So there are symmetry points in the spectrum. There's a symmetry point um, here. And there's one here. Uh, and the eigenvalues come symmetrically distributed around those points. If you look at the statistics of the eigenvalues close to these symmetry points, for example, you ask, how far is the, the first eigenvalue from that symmetry point? Um, you get a different answer in, the, in either the um, orthogonal, symplectic, or unitary cases. But if you ask questions about the statistics of the eigenvalue, local statistics far from the symmetry point, for example, what's the pair correlation of the eigenvalues at this point up here, then it's always unitary. So basically, for local statistics, if you're far from the symmetry point, you can't see the symmetry point. Does that answer your question? OK, so any other questions? Okay, so let's thank uh, John for his nice lecture. And, uh... <laughs>